So on today's episode, we're going to be talking about building out first party data for a customer centric marketing stack. It's a great episode you don't want to miss, so do stay tuned. Hi guys, welcome, welcome, welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast. I'm your host, Kunle Campbell, and this is the podcast dedicated to rapid growth in the direct-to-consumer selling space. So if you work in marketing at an e-commerce business or a founder, I'm going to help you sell more directly to your customers. And and the way we do this is um, every week we interview an expert, um, a founder at a direct-to-consumer e-commerce business or representative from a best-in-class e-commerce um, SaaS product, and their the, the remit really essentially for me is can you help you listeners who you know fervently listen to this podcast to help grow metrics such as conversions average order value repeat customers your audience size and ultimately sales if they say yes they can and they, they prove they can i get them on the show now speaking of which um, I'm, I'm joined with a very, very special guest today. He's, he goes by the name of Dan Magore. He is an award-winning entrepreneur and speaker and is the founder of Magore.io, which is an analytics and marketing technology, um, is a MarTech rather, consultancy. And um, he is, you know, you know, when we talk about like the OG growth hackers, he's, he's, he's right there at the top. Um, he's led teams in Kiss Metrics. You're, you're all aware of Kiss Metrics and CodeSchool.com. Um, he's also, um, you know, um, founded UTM.io back in 2015. And um, he has been selected as an ambassador of entrepreneurship by the US, you know, Department of State. Um, today, um, Dan is here to talk about growing e-commerce, you know, um, revenue with a much more integrated marketing stack. And, and that just is, is interesting to me because he, he takes a very customer centric view towards growth. And, and I think when you're moving from, um, the under 10 million to 10 million plus, um, you know, um, space, when you move into the realm of a 10 million plus business, you know, um, you, you, you absolutely need to be very customer centric, but imagine doing it from, from when you start, you know, a business, I'm not going to bat waffle a lot, you know, more than this. I just want to introduce, you know, Dan to, to the show. Welcome Dan. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Um, I've probably not done you sufficient justice in your introduction. Could you take, um, you know, a minute or less to, 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 uh, to give yourself a quick intro? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Maga.io. Uh, we are a marketing technology and analytics agency. Um, I got accidentally started in this business uh, six years ago when I left Kiss Metrics. Uh, so it's been a lot of fun. But my time at Kiss Metrics was super awesome. Uh, I had the mm -hmm. wonderful time to work with Heaton Shaw and Neil Patel. Uh, Neil was actually, uh, I, I replaced Neil uh, in his role, which was super great to do. I learned a lot Amazing. from the guy. Um, but I've been around since 1998. So I've been doing this for over 20 years now. I've just seen some shit is the easiest way to say it. Um, but I've had a ton of fun and uh, I, I, can't, uh, I can't do anything more than uh, love what I do. Incredible, incredible. There's a lot of passion there. Where, where are you dialing in from? Yeah, I'm in Orlando, Florida. Have you lived in Orlando all, all, all through or um, did you just- Definitely, yeah, I'm definitely not from Orlando, Florida. Uh, I've been here for, I think about 15 uh, to 16 years. I'm originally from Pittsburgh. Um, so, but I came down here on a whim and kind of just got trapped and I met my wife here and uh, she's from here. So I ended up staying. Uh, Orlando's a great city to live. It's a great city to have a family, uh, but I would love to be in a big city like New York, Chicago, Boston, or San Francisco. Uh, Orlando's a, a awesome place, but it's a little bit of a small town. Yeah, the weather and the mist has put you there, hold you there. Exactly, the weather is great. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, okay. Um, I I really like your your ethos because from my conversation before, you know, we hit record um, on customer centricity. Do, do you want to just shed some more light on on why this should be sh should this be the north star in, in e commerce? You know, uh, marketing. Yeah, I think uh, commonly as marketers, especially when working anywhere, we kind of get lost in our own egos, right? We get focused so much on like, what do we want to do? And what are we trying to accomplish? And sometimes we lose sight of the customer. And at the end of the day, what our job to do is figure out how to deliver them magic, right? Like, we need to deliver them an experience that they really, really enjoy. And we need to make sure that we're trying to do everything in our power to understand what they want and what they need. And that's going to be really what helps you sell your products is the faster you can get inside of their head, start to listen to them, 
them, collect the feedback that you can, uh, and really learn what they're trying to accomplish and understand that there's different customer segments and different types of people. Um, that's really going to help you kind of push your business forward. And for us, we're always trying to figure out what's going to be best for the customer. Uh, because at the end of the day, without them, you have nothing. And uh, it can be hard because sometimes you get wrapped up in your own ego. Hey, I want to do this. I think I want to test out that new strategy. Uh, SMS would be one of those popular things that we always give marketers a hard time about uh, mm -hmm. because it's so focused on what you want. It has nothing to do with the customer. Um, so but you've got to be focused on what they want. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go into what you do. Uh, I'm at Gore.io. Um, so yeah. so the, the banner on your ad is convert more customers with marketing technology. Um, how can MarTech, you know, I, I believe it's the, the term is MarTech and it's used a yeah. lot at um, at an organization level, level, you know, when we're talking like Fortune 500 companies. But when we yeah. come down to the D2C, how can, um, you know, um, just D2C marketing directors um, have this MarTech um, you know, foundation or, or, or foresight to, to, towards really, or mindset rather, um, towards really, you know, delivering, um, you know, marketing that not just works for their, their company, but also works for the customers they're serving, their company serving through products. Yeah, I, I think marketing uh, technology is, of course, really, really big. I mean, we focus on calling it revenue infrastructure because at mm -hmm. the end of the day, this is going to be the infrastructure you use to basically pass around uh, the information on how your customers are ultimately trying to pay you. So um, we think when you think about like the marketing technology and how it's going to help you convert customers is a lot of times uh, marketing uh, tools are siloed. So they are you have a marketing automation tool. It has a bunch of data. You have your e-commerce platform. It has a bunch of data. You have your analytics tool. Maybe it has some of that data, but these tools aren't really connected um, and you're not connecting it across many, many different tools, which makes it a little hard to know what the customer is doing. How are they interacting with the site? How can you properly track them? So a key component of that is really trying to make sure that those tools get tightly integrated. Um, they're able to share data really, really effectively um, and you're able to track as much as you possibly can because first First party data is where everything is going, right? I mean, mm. the death of the cookie is coming and all of this uh, stuff that's about to happen with privacy and everybody's focused on like, I want to have as much first party data as I can. And whether you're a Fortune 500 company or, I mean, doing $5 million a year, at the end of the day, you really do need that first party data. Um, that customer data that you can collect is your most valuable business asset. And that's actually like our business's mission is to help businesses of all sizes realize that their customer data is their most valuable asset. And it's, mm -hmm. it's really, really powerful. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to be able to uh, build a marketing infrastructure uh, to really be able to handle that data, to be able to be respectful with that data, and then also to leverage it to provide a better customer experience. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if you're a, a $500,000 a year business or $50 million business, um, you should be able to leverage that data appropriately and effectively to uh, provide your customer a better experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's flash what first party data is and some people are scratching their heads right now yeah. um, do you want to quickly define first party data and then we'll move swiftly into um you know the the, the, the technologies that will help you know um you know get, get first party data, data from the context of of, uh, of a d2c e-commerce um you know organization yeah uh, and really good question i agree i think uh first party and third party data can be a little confusing naturally uh third party data which is the uh, the flip side of it is typically when you're getting data from a data enrichment provider or somebody's sending you data such as an example anything that's facebook that's considered third party data so if you're using facebook to run advertising and you have their pixels on your sites anything that's going on there is considered a third party data stream um, and any information you're being passed from an enrichment provider maybe you're using something like uh, full contact or a Experian or a Cheetah. Um, there's a bunch of companies that you can use to give you third party data. But you also have to understand is once the data is somewhere else, it's considered third party as well. So Google Analytics would somewhat be considered third party data because you don't actually own the data that's in their platform. That data is being tracked on your site, but it's going to a third party and now it's on that service. So there's definitely a blurred line there. The first party data, once again, don't get me wrong, Google Analytics is still considered first party data because it's data that you're tracking about your customers. But first party data is when you're able to take data and save it inside of your own systems and then be able to leverage that later. Now where the line gets really blurred is the definition of what is a cookie because you have a first party cookie and then you have a third party cookie. And that's where all the 
the craziness on the internet right now is coming about because a first party cookie is a cookie you actually created on your website that you save, you maintain, it's in your code. And that's mm -hmm. really where the, the most magic can happen is when you get really, really sophisticated and can create your own first party cookies uh, because now you save the data, you manage it, you save it into your data warehouse, which uh, you own and that's where uh, first party data really resides is when you actually own it, you you can control it, um, maybe host it on somebody else's server, but it, it's technically your data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So with so in the in the context of e commerce, how how should like <laughs> a Shopify merchant, um, you know, um, collect first party data? I, I, I really want to yeah. so sort of simplify this, and then I'll, I'll ask you yeah. some, so so much more. Anytime oh, um, a customer gives you their information, that's first party mm -hmm. data, right? So if a customer came to your Shopify website and let's say you're using just Uno as your pop-up tool and they fill mm -hmm. out that form, they've given you their information, which is going to mean that that is now first party data. That is now your own data. You own that property. So that's going to be the stereotypical situation. So if somebody goes through your checkout flow, that's first party data. That's all data that they have given you, you now have ownership of, and it's considered first party data. So that's where... Uh, all that first party stuff really uh, comes from is when it's given to you compared to when it's if a customer gives it to you, it's first party. If you collect it from a third party, then it's no longer uh, first party data. Okay, but when Shopify is hosted on on a cloud, you know, yeah, um, and um, someone gets on your website, adds adds an item to cart, you see all of that in your Shopify dashboard. Um, yeah. Given that that data is in your Shopify dashboard, would you consider that first party data? Or would you consider a third party data? You're not ex exactly hosting it, it's with Shopify. Yeah, so, and that's a really, really good question. And that's where uh, when I brought up the Google Analytics stuff, I think it gets, the line gets a little bit more blurred because of the definition mm -hmm. of what a cookie is. When it comes to like when somebody fills out the information on Shopify and is actually sending you that data, that's yours. Shopify is merely just hosting your data uh, and keeping it for you, right? So that data, if you were to ever leave Shopify, you would take that data with you, you own that data, you would be able to keep all of that. So that's, that's considered your first party data. Shopify is just holding it. The reason why the Google Analytics situation is so confusing is because at the end of the day, the data that you've given to Google Analytics it's anonymized and Google now has it and you can't exactly get it from them and then have it deleted from their product very easily. But the reason why it gets even more confusing is because Google is considered what's known as a third party cookie, right? Yeah. So that's a cookie that you're adding to your site. Shopify isn't a cookie, right? So that's where there's no third party there. Um, yes, they're running your store, but it's not a cookie. So when somebody gives you the information, they're literally putting it into your web form, but Shopify is just providing that service. So um, that would be where the first party sits. Okay, so would you suggest? Because I remember back in the days, um, I used to my my I had a a mentor, and he would tell me to go into he he, he gave a tool which I'm trying to look for now, but I can't quite find it. It was an alternative to Google Analytics, and there were server raw server logs. We could you know we would export every single action going on on our sites on an Excel spreadsheet. It was tiring. It was crunching as we try and process you know um, a day's worth of traffic and it could take minutes you know 10 20 minutes to process a full day i can't quite remember i'll i'll, I'll figure out the name of the tool and here's like look um this these are the server logs you can get the ib you could get so much more data here as compared to this is like the days of it my days of seo as compared to google analytics and you know, a lot of the time it will, will, will just reference all of that stuff you know on, on that um on that on, on that platform which was hosted on our server by the way mm -hmm. um so so my question is do you think with you know we've, we've made a lot of progress from that with cloud computing do you think we're going to move to that system again um given the blurred lines with google analytics um in terms of just owning data or do we just take the most tangible bits of or most important bits of um customer actions or customer data and just act on it like email address and um you know potent real key actions such as add to cart and, and the like yeah so i i definitely think 
one, it's, I mean, the, the world is your oyster in regards to what you want to track nowadays and mm -hmm. keep all that stuff. There's definitely a big momentum to having things stored on your own servers, having things in your own data warehouse, and being able to process the data. I mean, in, in uh, April of 2020, we acquired a business intelligence company um, that focuses, they're a consulting company that focuses just on data warehousing, business intelligence, and how do we connect all that stuff. And we acquired that company specifically because the market is definitely switching more and more to, I want to capture as much data as I can. I want to put it into a data warehouse. I want to put it into a data lake. And then I'm going to use a BI tool because I can do whatever I want. I can mash all this data up. So I would definitely agree the market is switching more in that direction. I think if you looked back from like the past 15 years, um, there was a huge switch to web analytics with Google Analytics, Adobe, Kissmetrics, Mixpanel, Amplitude. And those tools are still really, really popular. Um, they're very, very great because you can it's it, what we call is it basically democratizes the data. If it's done appropriately, like if you're one of our clients, as an example, we'll set up the taxonomy and the schema and the tracking so everything is tracked, right? But at the same time, you're not going to track everything because then you're going to have what we would call bloat, right? You're going to have a bunch of technical debt and people aren't even going to use most of the stuff. When you mm -hmm. have a, a citizen analyst, right, which when we say citizen analyst, we're talking about anybody who can like look at the data, um, they're not going to dig into the most extreme parts of it. However, when you're working with really, really robust machine learning, artificial intelligence, or senior data analysts, um, which is the case for a lot of companies that are using BI, we track everything, right? There is a entire, everything that happens, every page load, every click, everything is sent to the data warehouse uh, or the data lake. And then we, we hold on to that data because we don't know when we are going to use it. It might never get used, but who cares? Data is really cheap at this point. But when we do need it, we can very quickly look back at that data uh, and then use that to, to create some really, really popular outcomes, whether that be multi-touch attribution, whether that be uh, figuring out your return on ad spend, whether that's trying to figure out, uh, hey, we now have this segmentation data. Going back to the conversation about uh, third-party data, um, it's creepy the amount of information that we can get from just your email, right? So uh, with just your email, and I'll use my wife as an example, um, I put in my wife's corporate email into Experian's data enrichment product, and it immediately spit back that she's a sports mom, she drives an SUV, she drives a large SUV, she's very into fashion, like, and it spits out all these attributes. When you have that third-party data that comes at a later time and you can then map it back to the IDs in the data warehouse, um, you can figure out some really crazy stuff. I mean, Target can predict uh, pregnancy with 92% accuracy within six weeks of somebody becoming pregnant. Like, that's... That's crazy, right, for me. Yeah. So, yeah, storing yeah. all the data and all the behaviors can really help. Yeah, you don't judge people by what they say, it's by what they do. And um, yeah, yeah. Once, and when, when they interact with, 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 yeah, with stuff in your store, it's, it's fascinating. Okay, so... Have you, have you yeah. uh, on that point, I, I apologize to interrupt. Have you ever heard of the book Dataclism? No, I haven't, no. Amazing Check book. It it's though. written by uh, one of the founders of OkCupid, and the the like the subline of the book is like uh, what people are actually doing, not what they're actually saying. Uh, exactly. And it's an amazing, amazing to see what people say. And then what they go do, especially they go in do. the relationship concept. So I would go mm -hmm. check that book out. You'd love it. Yeah, yeah. Just open it on. on um, so I'll link to it in the show notes. Okay, um, you mentioned the importance of um, you know data consolidation platforms, and and one one platform you mentioned was Segment. Without yeah. you blowing the trumpet of, of Segment, which which you should if if they're such a good tool, from a D two C perspective how if, if a d2c business was to come to you saying that look we're we're very much interested in um first party data we want to start um hyper personalization we don't necessarily want to do it now but we know we'll be in a position based on our growth trajectory to that we'll be in the need to to to, to start to implement hyper hyper personalization um how or how would you help us with our stack with our marketing stack you know our marketing uh, our tech our marketing tech stack um from that perspective in line um with um say if they're running like a, a shopify store um how would you approach it and where does segment you know actually you know come into into the mix 
Great question. Um, I mean, I think the the hard thing that we see with kind of marketing technology is that people go buy stuff because it's shiny. So we always kind of push back on like, hey, uh, just kind of track all your data and then buy something shiny in the future. We always try to be as objective focused as possible. So like um, trying to figure out like, hey, are we trying to acquire more customers? Are we trying to acquire more emails? And starting with kind of some of the business objectives or uh, we need to gain visibility into our cart process. Um, once we outline those objectives and get a little bit of a clearer understanding, it's really about how are we going to capture the data. Um, Shopify is a, an amazing platform, um, and it has a lot of integrations with it. Like their their ecosystem of tools is amazing. The hardship, though, is that you need to be able to have one tool that can consistently track all the customer data and then distribute that amongst all the different tools that you have. So while the the use case or the excuse me, the tool that you brought up, of course, is Segment. Um, Segment's not the only one that does that. The Segment is a customer data platform. And one of the biggest values of a customer data platform is that um, instead of integrating 25 tools, you integrate the customer data platform and then you integrate the 25 tools in with that customer data platform. And what this does is gives you only one way that you have to pipe data around. So when you go to your website and somebody's on Shopify, if you've integrated it with a complex thing, you have to integrate Klaviyo, you have to integrate Google Analytics, you've got to add AdWords, you've got to add Facebook pixels, you've got all of these things you have to integrate with it. Um, that requires development time and work. So what we recommend to do is use a CDP, a customer data platform. So that way you integrate one product into your website, saves you a ton of time, ton of development is, uh, errors and issues. And then the CDP is responsible for the relationship with the other integrators. So they'll translate into that other tool, integrate into that other tool, and they'll manage that data for you. Um, you just have to basically connect it through an API key, which makes that nice and easy. Um, however, the, the CDP space is, is really big. I mean, there, there's over 100 customer data platforms out there. There's probably about 50 real CDPs out there. I mean, Segment is the big behemoth in the room. Uh, they were the first one basically to market. Uh, M Particle is the other really big player, but they're really Fortune 1000. You also have another company called MetaRouter, which is really popular. Uh, but there's a lot of other ones out there, Blue Conic, Blue Core, all of these, uh, Ex Exponea, there's a ton of them. But Segment is definitely the, the big one. The big thing about those platforms is that you have to track what your customer is doing. So as a customer visits the site, you of course have a page view, just like you would have in Google Analytics. You would connect Segment to Google Analytics and now Segment would power what's happening in GA um, and Segment would send those page views. But when somebody clicks a button, adds to cart, somebody views a product, Segment can be configured to track every single one of those action and then also mm -hmm. make sure that it gets saved into your downstream tools so that what excuse me, that way it can be used later to be able to remarket your customers, to be able to send them mm -hmm. personalization, all that stuff. So I think if you're a, any type of e-commerce business, you really need to know how the customer is using your website from a behavior mm -hmm. perspective. And you need to know which customer is doing that. And I think mm -hmm. that's a common thing where people are, uh, drop the ball is like Google Analytics doesn't tell you the customer's name. It doesn't tell you lifetime value. It doesn't tell you mm -hmm. repeat purchase. It doesn't tell you the, the most important valuable metrics that you need on your business. Because it's, once again, it's, it's anonymized data, which is, has some identity resolution, not very good. Um, and it just, it's owned by Google, which is free, which is great. GA4 is coming out, which is going to add some of those features. But at the same time, I want to know when John Smith comes to the website. I want to know what John Smith did. I want to attach that to his email address. And I want to make sure that all of my tools know that John is looking at boots and socks and also hats. So I can then send him the right messaging uh, to get him to come buy those boots, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that's really, it's all about setting up that tracking. It's a base, it's a foundation, which pipes into every other tool. Um, yeah. So I guess you're, you you have to be very deliberate with the tools that stack on segment to, to ensure that, you know, um, the, the necessary API connections are in place to pass on all the um, the data points that matter to you as a as a business. Yeah, most most tools are. I mean, there's over 300 integrations with uh, Segment, so most of the popular tools at an e-commerce business are integrated with it already. And mm -hmm. if they're not integrated with it, there are ways to, of course, still integrate it through webhooks or other things like that. Um, but most tools are are pretty well connected with Segment. It's it, their their arsenal is is pretty big. I mean, most e-commerce companies are using uh, Segment and leveraging the platform to be able to manage their customer data to create more magical outcomes. Mm -hmm. So does um, d does your company, your agency, focus largely on delivering CDPs or do you do a lot more than that? 
Yeah, uh, really, really, we do a lot more than that. I think customer data platforms, of course, is a, a big part of our business because it's like it, you just every marketing stack now has them. So that mm -hmm. is, of course, a big part of it. But our business is really centered around helping companies build their stack. So a company would come to us and basically say, hey, these are the objectives we want to accomplish. These are the problems we're having today. How are we going to build a revenue infrastructure to manage that? How are we going to build the architecture? So while we, of course, help with CDPs, we are also involved heavily in marketing automation, CRM platforms, analytics platforms, like I mentioned, business intelligence, um, but also a lot of like conversion rate optimization. So like multiple, um, uh, as an example, Hydro, which is like the Peloton of rowing, uh, we manage their conversion rate optimization programs. There's no customer data wow. platform. Uh, we do all of their Google optimized testing, all of that's measured in amplitude. So we measure uh, and manage their funnels, uh, but there's no CDP. So like a CDP is not a requirement. Um, the thing that you have to be aware of is that a CDP has cost um, and some companies just don't, the value is not there for the cost. And if you're a company like uh, Hydro, I mean, you, they basically sell one product. Like it's very similar to Peloton, like they sell one thing. You don't need this crazy rich customer data profile in a segment like this um, when you're just trying to measure an e-commerce funnel sometimes. So if you sell one product, you really have to ask yourself the question, what's the value I'm going to get from this tool um, compared to how much money am I going to pay for it? And I think that's where marketers' budgets have just gone through the roof and they just they, they buy tools because they can uh, when they really should be buying tools because it makes them money. Uh, and I think... Uh, all marketers get lost between cool and uh, profits. I, it, it happens to everybody. So, so how do you sort of get and how do you trim down? How do you get on a diet? What, what, what are the first things to do to, to know, okay, you have a, a glot in yeah. um, your, your marketing, you know, um, you know, stack. What, what, what are the first, what the tell, 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 tell signs, you know, of, of, um, of a glot? Yeah, no, uh, I think that's uh, hysterical. And I think a lot of companies need to go on a diet with their MarTech spend uh, and really look at it. So one thing, uh, interestingly enough, if you went to uh, maga.io, you scroll down a little bit on our homepage, we mm -hmm. have a, a WYSIWYG, what you see, what you get, uh, Stack Builder. If you click and build that, go to that tool, you can put in your domain and it will pop up all the tools that are installed on your website. And you can actually draw lines in between how the data flows between them. I totally forgot about that. Uh, but that will help you see all of the tools you have. Um, I think the most common thing that we see is two tools that do the same thing are both installed on the website, right? So um, you may have Intercom, which does email automation and also chat. But then you may also have live chat, which you're using on your website. Now, mm. you may be able to save some money by going to Intercom, right? Uh, and just using their live chat system. But there may be some valid use cases why you're using the live chat system, which is another company. Um, you really have to analyze those uh, differences and really understand what is the value I may be getting? How can I negotiate my other deal to get those deals down? We see this a lot with pop-up tools. People have multiple pop-up tools on their website. Yeah. We see companies that have multiple marketing automation tools. Um, and sometimes it just comes down to a lack of knowledge on how to use one or the other. Um, but it's really looking at where is the duplication, right? Where are the things that uh, overlap with each other? And then how big is that overlap and how can I save money? I will say I'm the first person to say, like, don't go for the all-in suite, right? Like, I do not believe in going into the HubSpot all-in suite or going to the Adobe all-in suite. The best of breed stacks really do win. Um, the integrations are so much better now that you do have to have that. So there is, there is a reason why uh, tools are more expensive. But the number one reason why companies are wasting money is because they buy a tool, they buy the upgrade and the upgrade and the upgrade because the sales rep is really good. And then they have no idea why they bought it. And I see this happen all the time where um, I'm not going to call out any companies, but like people buy this $25,000 a year feature and then they come to us and they're like, well, how do we use this? And we're like, well, you should have never bought that. Like you don't need that for another 10 years. Like um, they're like, oh, and it's like, but that happens a lot. Don't, don't buy the upgrade. Start small. Uh, I don't be more organic about it, but everybody's like, they bite off the whole enchilada and then they're trying to figure out why the machine learning never gets used. And it's like, uh, you don't, you shouldn't have bought it. Like you don't need it yet. So either way, start small. Start small, start small. Fascinating. Um, so while we're at it, you, you talked about funnel optimization and I think a big, big issue, having spoken to several, you know, e-commerce directors and e-commerce managers is, is this issue of attribution. Um, what's your approach to, to attribution at the, at the moment? How do you help your, your clients actually solve, um, you know, marketing attribution, um, you know the, the puzzle 
Yeah, uh, man, I love marketing attribution. Oh man, uh, so <laughs> <Me too>. I <laughs> <know> it. <laughs> um, so I I was hired about a year and a half ago to write a multi-touch attribution uh, study for a large uh, financial services company, and we had to interview all the multi-touch attribution vendors in the space. We had to do a lot of research on what like is the difference between an MTA model at one company, what is the data, and all that stuff. So like I'm definitely uh, in over my head in regards to MTA, but. I think the, the, the hardest part with um, attribution, one, everybody needs to start out with first touch and last touch before they ever even consider going to a multi-touch attribution model. But I think the, the fundamental flaw that people have is like, if you go from a first touch and last touch uh, attribution model, you're doing really, really good, right? If you know the how somebody discovered you and that they purchased something, that's fantastic, right? Like that's super, super helpful. I place a lot of value on first touch because I want to know how people discovered me and then ultimately purchase. Like I place a good amount of value on that. And then you of course have last touch. What was the last campaign before they purchased something? Um, which I think is also really, really helpful. But the problem with last touch is many times people put an overemphasis on the last touch. And the problem with that is, is you don't know what I'm thinking. Um, yes, you sent me an email, but that email wasn't why I purchased. I just happened to have gotten the email and clicked on it. So um, you, it's really, really um, messy when you think about attribution because you don't know the exact reason if that's why they did it. So sometimes people put an overemphasis and going back to the customer centric part, they don't think about what the customer is trying to do anymore. They don't try to understand the why. They only try to understand the actions. And in attribution, mm -hmm. that's it's kind of hard to think about and uh, because many times people are just clicking on something because it's there, not because it drove them to purchase, uh, which makes it really hard with that last touch. So I focus, of course, a lot on helping companies get their first touch and last touch. Naturally, you can do that in Google Analytics. Uh, not very easy, I will say that. Like, it's just not very great because it doesn't track a customer over an extended period of time or give you their information or the repeat purchase rate. Um, Mixpanel, which is a product uh, that we know really, really well, really, really popular product analytics tool, don't let it confuse you. Um, it's product analytics work really, really good in marketing. Um, product teams just have a lot more budget. Um, they have a, a thing known as a super property, which you can store first touch and last touch in, which is basically a cookie. Uh, I'm actually doing a project right now with a client um, and it and they're like mesmerized at the data that they're able to see because they can actually see first touch and last touch. Uh, and now also look at it, um, which is good. But the, when you have first touch and last touch, the goal of that is to optimize campaigns. Um, and I think people get lost in the woods because they all of a sudden go, I have first touch, last touch attribution tracking. Well, what do I do now? You go optimize your campaigns. It's, uh, it's really, really meant for paid media uh, and email marketing where you can track stuff. Go optimize the campaign. So I think that's where people kind of, they're like, I have it, but what do I do? Um, you should know what you're going to do with it before you go build it. Uh, you don't just build it because I said it in a podcast. Um, like, I think that's where some people kind of build stuff with no understanding of what they're going to do with it next. Yeah, uh, I absolutely agree. I, th I think one major question um, that's in the mind of e-commerce business and e-commerce managers is what happens in the middle between the first and the last touch? Yeah. Uh, how many other touch points, you know, um, typically on average or you know on a median actually deliver a sale you know when they they, they find out about us on facebook um how many other times would they hear about us or would they have heard about us before what's the sales cycle like and what's in that cycle from start to finish what's the average and once they get that yeah. they kind of get that formula and that's when I guess they could start talking about like the optimization of campaigns and you know, it's messy at the moment. Oh my God. It's you so know, it's messy. messy. What, how do we get that story in between? Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, lovely enough. I mean, we are in the, uh, uh, the, the gold rush era of MarTech for sure. So um, there's a ton of tools out there. If you went, if you just Googled Maga.io multi-touch attribution, you will get our uh, advanced introduction on how you should look at multi-touch. Uh, multi-touch is huge, but there's, there's a lot of companies out there that now provide this. You can just drop a JavaScript on your website, do some additional things to your tracking, and you'll have that. Um, mm -hmm. Windsor.ai is one of the popular cheap ones that are out there. You have companies out there, of course, like Supermetrics, which provides this. Um, you have uh, Rockerbox, which is really popular for D2C. So uh, 
um, they're like two thousand dollars a month and up though so uh, definitely more expensive uh, mm -hmm. but really really powerful tool I mean their clients are mm -hmm. instacart uh, to I mean hydro is a, a client of theirs a lot of our uh, e-commerce companies use them yeah. um, attribution mm -hmm. app is another popular one which works on the b2b side also works on b2c but I say attribution app is much better for the direct to consumer subscription models their their model is really good for subscriptions there's a ton of companies out there that do multi-touch attribution windsor.ai is the more cheap one same with supermetrics the 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 problem that you have is like i think people get lost between the forest and the trees here a little bit you have multi-touch attribution multi-touch attribution does not tell you the customer's journey um it will tell you the distribution in a mathematical way of hey did somebody come from this channel and then what were the things that happened in between but the whole point of it is to all <laughs> sorry no worries. Uh, what the whole point of it is to do is to count those uh, actions and then to distribute them across that customer's journey in a mathematical way so we can say this is how much money that cost and then this is your return on ad spend. Customer journey mapping and customer journey tracking uh, is, is definitely a little bit different. Don't get me wrong. I think they get a little bit blurred. Um, mm. But many of the attribution tools... They'll tell you a little bit like, oh, customers are typically first touch Facebook, and then they have some email, then they have some direct, and then they have some last touch. But when you aggregate that across thousands of customers, you can see some trend, but really uh, it's not going to be the best way to, to optimize your customer journey because it's telling you just acquisition touch points. It's not telling you page touch points. It's not telling you behavior attributes when they're going through that. And that's where customer journey mapping or analytics tools are going to be much better for that. But um you have to be careful with each multi-touch attribution vendor because they all treat your data differently. They all require mm -hmm. you to implement differently and uh, they all report data back to you differently. There's look back windows, there's look forward windows, there's uh, all this stuff um, that you have to take into consideration. Um, but I think uh, Nielsen was the one who said it to us best when we went and did our last study. The only thing that multi-touch attribution is good for is optimizing your last 90 days worth of campaign spent. So. Mm -hmm. If you're going to use it, um, there's no holy grail. It's about optimizing your campaigns that you used in the last 90 days or whatever your conversion window is uh, and focusing on using that for optimization. It's not yeah. some holy grail. Most brands fall within that 90-day um, cycle. Um, yeah. What about this app track and transparency, um, ATT, um, iOS rolling out? How, how is that? In, in e-commerce, it's been devastating because, um, especially in D2C e-commerce, not, not necessarily Fortune 500 retail, but yeah. in, in, in D2C e-commerce, um, a, a lot of the first points, you know, awareness, you know, the, the customer awareness is driven from social media, you know, whether it's a Facebook, whether it's a TikTok, whether it's a Snapchat ad. Um, and um, they, they typically close with brand name search on Google. Um, yeah. What? How has this, you know, affected Martech and, and what you do? Yeah. Well, it's going to be great for me. I hate to say it because uh, people have this problem. They don't really know how to figure it out. Um, and it's becoming more and more complicated. So I think that um, the privacy stuff, I think uh, at the end of the day, I think privacy is really important. But I think Apple is making a stand about privacy because they're they're in a pissing match with many of these other large companies where their revenue is dependent upon that. And Apple is using this as a competitive advantage. So I think we have to understand that there is definitely a level of privacy that people care about. And then there's also just businesses being businesses uh, and trying to compete with each other. So um, I think it's it's kind of unfair because it's really going to hurt the small business more than anybody. Uh, and it's really going to push a lot of people down, which I think is really unfortunate. Um, but this goes back to the whole first party conversation. Um, a lot of companies come to us because they want to be able to use that first party data as much as they can. And when you think about these advertising networks and them sending you, that's third party data, right? You're spending money on their network using their data to send you customers. And then you're also dependent upon their technology to track it. Now, when you have a good setup and you have your own first party cookies, right? You have your own stuff that's set up. You have your own analytics that can track. Um, this prevents less of the problem uh, or prevents uh, some of the problem because as an example, uh, UTMs. UTMs aren't going to go away. UTMs are still allowed to stick around on the internet, right? You're still allowed to send query parameters from Facebook to your website, right? There's still ways to track all that stuff. The hardship is, is that f for most companies, understanding how to capture that first party data 
they're clueless, right? They're dependent upon third-party cookies. They're depending upon all these things. So this is really going to hurt, uh, unfortunately, the smaller businesses, right? Which I feel really bad uh, about that. But um, there are going to be workarounds. There are going to be ways to, to work around it. But it is going to suck uh, because the internet is constantly changing. The internet is always going to change. Um, but there's already solutions for it. So like, it just depends on if you're part of the solution or if you're just going to be the victim as part of the problem. Exactly. Um, so, um, but we, I mean, Facebook has already come up with an extremely uh, smart solution to be able to solve some of this in the short term. And uh, one of the key things you'll notice when you go through, um, if you were to click on a Facebook ad, that Facebook ad is going to take you to uh, your website typically, and it's going to add a query parameter to the end of the URL. Now, the problem is, is that Facebook on your website is a third party cookie. So they get warned before they come to your website, oh, you're going to have all this stuff, or you're going to use this app, and it's going to track you. Well, that sucks, don't get me wrong, but people are many times gonna move forward with it. Facebook knows that there's gonna be people that say no to this type of information and, and remove that. Well, what's gonna happen is that uh, Apple is stripping the Facebook cross-domain tracking ID. So on the end of the URL, if you ever click it, it says face, uh, FBCLID. That's your user profile inside of that. That's hashed in there. Well, Apple's stripping that. Well, everybody's freaking out because Apple's gonna start stripping the URLs. So what, is, what does Facebook do? Facebook then says, great, well, we're not gonna send people with these IDs anymore. We're gonna send them with a custom short domain so I can now read the refer when they hit our website. So everybody's probably familiar with when somebody visits your website and they're, they're coming from a URL, your website knows that there is a refer, right? Mm -hmm. It knows the URL that somebody came from. Well, mm -hmm. Facebook is now just automatically creating these crazy URLs that are just a URL with a hash bang on the end, or no hash bang on the end of it, and you can't turn that off. Well, now Facebook's able to get around the intelligent ad tracking stuff. So uh, the thing that I just stress is that there's always going to be a solution to work around it. Mm -hmm. The problem that's gonna happen though is that only the really rich companies are able to afford those solutions, yeah. um, and many of the Initially, smaller businesses are gonna get shoved out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you mentioned, you, you touched base on, on UTMs. Um, yeah, is is with the UTM. Um, what are you best? What attribution? What type of attribution would you best use with the UTM? Last or first? Or can you sort of get you know the picture from both? Just changing the the view. What's your suggestion on how to effectively use a UTM um, to inform um, you know marketing going forward? Yeah, UTMs are fantastic. I mean, they've been around forever. Um, I, we own UTM.io, so we spend a lot of time working with UTMs with big brands. Um, I think UTMs, first you have to focus on what is going to be your convention. Like, make sure that you have consistency and stuff like that. That's, of course, the most important part. Make sure it's consistent. Um, it depends on the type of campaign. So you have awareness campaigns. You have um, things where you're trying to create awareness for your brand. Naturally, you're going to measure that campaign on your first touch attribution, right? And seeing how much you're willing to pay. And then, of course, when you do your last touch attribution, you're leveraging your UTMs, um, you're looking more for a purchase, right? Your last touch is going to be most focused on the purchase. You have to be able to understand the math of how much you can pay for a customer um, to be able to get them through the purchase process. What is their lifetime value? How much money can I spend? And you need to distribute that across your first touch and last touch. How much am I willing to pay to get somebody on my website, maybe become a lead? Um, and then how much, how much math and money am I willing to pay for them to become a customer? You have to break those things down. So if it takes 10 leads, Needs to get one customer, do the math and figure out uh, how much you're going to do there. Um, but UTMs, I mean, I think, uh, and this is something that Apple's been very clear on, they're not going to try to remove UTMs, right? Like Apple's not getting rid of UTMs. Like nobody has an intent intended use case to get rid of uh, UTM tracking. But you just have to make sure if you want to have good attribution tracking, you have to have a good UTM convention. Um, mm -hmm. I just did a webinar on this with a company called Funnel.io talking about what is a basic UTM convention and then what is an advanced UTM convention. Um, and I think it'd be really helpful for the listeners uh, to check that out because as an e-commerce business, the way you structure your UTMs with inside of the campaign name can really be a game changer on how you see your ads in AdWords or how you see them in Facebook. And that's where you have to do, as we would say, an advanced UTM convention, as in, you know the geo, you know the intent, you know the product, um, you might know the, the size of that product, 
all in the campaign name. Um, so it makes it easier to build out your ad accounts and then find things. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, once again, really advanced convention stuff. Um, extremely valuable for e-commerce though yeah please share the link so so i'll share in the, in the show notes um if you can yeah absolutely okay right um i i, I think i think this is this <laughs> i didn't expect to also go into this you know level of detail it's, it's been amazing <laughs> thus far now before i let you go you you just um released a book which is build cool shit um yeah. blueprint to to creating uh, marketing technology stuff do you want to just you know talk a little bit about it and um and it's free, actually, you know, get your free copy now. Um, do you just want to shed some more light on this? I'm going to link to it in the show notes. Yeah, and, you know, I think we'll actually do – I think this will be a fun test for everybody. If you if you want to get a free copy of my book, we build a text bot so you can actually test this out. So if, if you pull out your phone really quickly um, mm -hmm. and you type in the number 415-915-9011 – I'll say that again, 415 415- 915-9011 and you just type the word martech to it it will walk you through a text bot to actually collect uh your address and then send you to an order form so that way you can finalize uh getting the book uh the book is free um the book is all about how do you kind of understand marketing technology this giant landscape what are the seven tools that are uh growing really fast in the space and are really being used how do you integrate your stack together to create these amazing personalized experience and it's focused on a real case study uh, we worked with a company called realthread.com um, they're a t-shirt printing company they work in an e-commerce fashion but also b2b fashion um, and by using the stack we increased their business by 51 percent in just over a year so an increase of orders by 51 percent and that was e-commerce orders um, where we saw those uh, increases. And that was because uh, we built the stack to better track the customer, better communicate with the customer, and to provide them a better quality of the experience. Uh, and then it all came down to properly integrating the tools. And that's what the tool, the book talks about. It's super short, it's got colored pictures in it. Um, everybody loves it because it's a two hour read. It's not, it's not gonna take you six days. Uh, it's something you could read on a Sunday afternoon and it's actionable. So you're actually gonna read the book and be like, Man, I could do something with this. Uh, so I hate fluff. So uh, I hope I hope everybody enjoys it. Incredible, incredible, Dan. Um, thank you so much for for coming. You know, on 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 the Two X e Commerce podcast show, I could you know go on for hours with you um, because you know your stuff. That's the most important thing. And um, I've learned a ton um, from this conversation in regards to you know marketing stack what the big boys are doing what we can learn from it in, in mid-tier retail and e-commerce in general um it's been absolutely you know um amazing having you on here so for those who want to follow you are you active on any social media platforms yeah best place to find me is on linkedin so just okay. go to linkedin dan mcgoss where i'm active i'm on twitter and all the other things but i don't really use those networks okay. Okay, I just sent you an invite from, from Facebook, from LinkedIn, sorry. Awesome. Um, it's been a pleasure, as I said, you know, before. And um, thank you for, for, for coming on, on to Exit Commerce Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. This has been a pleasure.